Hi, I'm Dr. Justin Mann with Jack Spine and Pain Centers in Jacksonville, Florida. I'd like to take the next several minutes to talk with you about pain management and how that's possible without the use of opioid medications. This is a joint presentation between Jack Spine and Pain Centers, the University of Florida Health System, and the AIPAMI. Uh, the AIPAMI is a comprehensive project that addresses non-opioid pain management in adults ages 50 and older that live in Northeast Florida. The goal is the advancement of innovative pain education and care uh, through the development of provider and patient workshops such as this one, focused on integrative pain management. Um, just a bit about myself, I'm double board certified in both anesthesiology and interventional pain medicine. I uh, earned my medical doctorate through Mercer University School of Medicine in Macon, Georgia. I did my internship in internal medicine through Johns Hopkins University Sinai Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. I did a residency and fellowship in anesthesiology and pain medicine at the University of Alabama, Birmingham in Birmingham, Alabama. And since 2016, I've been at Jack Spine and Pain Centers in Jacksonville, Florida. While I am a paid consultant for a medical device company, uh, the point of this talk is to be an industry-free, non-biased presentation uh, for educational purposes and not for any particular medication or medical device. Um, by means of an outline, I'd like to start by discussing what is pain. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what are opioids and then what types of treatment are available that are non-opioid type treatments. Finally, we'll talk about you know, what you should do if you have pain and draw some conclusions from the other things that we've talked about today. In terms of pain as a definition, the International Association for the Study of Pain uh, is pretty much the leading authority. And uh, they've had a definition up until this last year. Um, and this last year, they have revised that definition uh, to encompass the things that you see on the slide. Uh, pain, as they describe it, is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. What's important to note in this definition is there's a concession made, and that is that uh, pain is as much a sensory experience that has an emotional component as a physical uh, experience with the physical component. You'll see a number of points uh, listed underneath that definition um, that include the idea that pain is a personal experience and that that is influenced by a number of factors, including biological factors, psychological factors, and social factors. Pain and nociception, which is the physical uh, transmission of pain signals, are different phenomena. And pain can't solely be inferred from activity in sensory neurons. In other words, if you had nerves and you could actually look and see at the signals uh, going between them and they were uh, sensory nerves, you couldn't infer just based on that activity that that was a sensation of pain and vice versa. Uh, through an individual's life experiences, they learn the concept of pain. And although pain usually serves an adaptive role, it can have adverse effects on function uh, and social and psychological well being. Uh, finally, verbal descriptions of pain are only one of several behaviors used to express pain. And an inability to communicate doesn't negate the possibility that um, a human or non human animal experiences pain. So these ideas of pain um, are important. And uh, really, the underscoring principle here is that you know, uh, pain is a subjective experience and it's not something that we have a test for as much as me and others in my field would love that. Um, it's something that we have to take at face value. And uh, if we have patients that are telling us that something feels like a burning pain, well, that's their experience and their best way of communicating that with us. Um, you'll see on the right side of the slide that there are both uh, acute and chronic forms of pain. When we talk about acute pain, we're generally talking about pain um, that's caused by an event that serves a purpose that usually doesn't last very long and where the focus is on treatment. For chronic pain, chronic pain is a maladaptive process. It really doesn't serve a purpose. It persists beyond the normal healing time for an injury or an event or a disease process. And the focus on chronic pain is more on self-management as opposed to treatment of the underlying issue. When we talk about pain complaints, back pain is uh, by and large the leading cause of disability in the United States and one of the most uh, common reasons for visits to uh, uh, physicians and providers in our healthcare system in the US. 13% uh, of adults you'll see have chronic back pain and that's 40 million adults in this country and it's definitely the most expensive medical problem in the United States. Uh, and when you combine it with neck pain, it accounts for over $130 billion of spending 
um, in 2016, which were some of the most recent figures that I could come across. Now you can only imagine it's probably gone up since then. Other pain complaints like osteoarthritis and headaches um, round out uh, some other common uh, you know, complaints that people have. More than 40 million adults suffer from osteoarthritis, which is a wear and tear form of arthritis and frequently is painful. It accounts, of course, for more than $80 billion in healthcare spending annually. Um, and is the most common uh, reason for orthopedic type surgeries involving the hip or the knee. Headaches uh, worldwide, half of the headaches uh, in, the, in the world have had, or sorry, half of the, the people in the world in the last year have had a headache at least once. Um, and between two and 4% of the world population have at least 15 headache days a month. That's a staggering number when you think about the number of people on this planet. Tension headache accounts for over $400 million in healthcare spending annually in this country. And overall, an estimated 100 million Americans live with some form of chronic pain. So who treats pain? Well, uh, mainly primary care physicians do. Now, um, if nothing else, primary care physicians or uh, PCPs or primary care providers are the number one uh, entry point for patients um, when they're looking to address their pain. Um, back pain, for instance, is the fourth most common reason for all PCP office visits worldwide in developed countries. And almost two thirds of patients with chronic pain have seen their PCP for help. Um, more than 95% of PCPs say that they treat patients with things like back pain or osteoarthritis. So certainly when someone experiences pain, many times they're going to their primary care provider uh, for advice on how to deal with uh, their pain complaint or uh, for treatment options. Um, of course, pain specialists like myself, um, you know, we encompass kind of a broad category of physicians with varying backgrounds. Um, most of the people who do what I do uh, have a background in both uh, anesthesiology um, or things like physical medicine, although uh, neurology and even psychiatry are um, fields that uh, can provide entry into this type specialty. Um, myself in particular, I'm uh, sub-specialized by the American Board of Medical Subspecialties. Um, and that's the same uh, governing body that certifies uh, subspecialists like cardiologists or gastroenterologists, GI doctors. Um, now, surgeons, of course, can treat pain, and pain can be a primary or a secondary indication for surgery. Um, many surgeries result in pain relief. And while uh, I don't think you would find that most surgeons would say that they treat pain, um, of course, uh, they do in treating the underlying condition uh, if that's what's causing pain. Um, opioids. Well, opioids are a class of medication that are um, related to or derived from opium. Um, opioids uh, work on opiate receptors, and opioids have been around for thousands of years. Um, there are reports of uh, opioids being used in ancient Egypt and other reports of opioids being used throughout history and throughout various civilizations for treatment of pain. Um, they're used uh, for pain relief mostly and have uh, other effects as well. These encompass medications like morphine, codeine, tramadol, fentanyl, hydrocodone, oxycodone, hydromorphone, um, and even heroin. Um, opiates and opioids, uh, those terms are used mostly interchangeably nowadays. And for the purpose of this uh, talk, are, we're going to be pretty much meaning the same thing. So um, in addition to pain relief, though, opioids have a number of other effects in the body. And some of those are immediate effects, and some of those are effects that um, rear up over time. Some of the immediate effects of taking an opioid, and if any of you have taken one in the past, you'll know um, drowsiness is pretty much one of the um, uh, main side effects that people experience. Um, one of the more worrisome side effects, though, that can be experienced is respiratory depression, um, which is the leading cause of death in those who overdose on opiates. Of course, there are other things like constipation and even nausea that can accompany opiate use as immediate side effects. Constipation being the one side effect that over time uh, never gets better, usually for most patients. And so you'll see that as a long-term side effect there. Um, physical dependence and tolerance are also long-term side effects. Those are things that develop independently of addiction, um, but there are also things like mood changes, um, effects on um, uh, the endocrine system, on libido, uh, particularly for men, on decreased immune uh, responses, and even causing increased pain. Uh, you say, well, how does that work? Uh, well, there's a phenomenon called opiate-induced hyperalgesia in which um, uh, chronic exposure to opiates can actually sensitize the body and increase transmission of pain uh, signals. 
Um, there are various opiate receptors in the body. You can see in the figure, there are mu opiate receptors, kappa opiate receptors, delta uh, opiate receptors, and even subtypes of those receptors. And you can see their activities there. So opiates don't work on just one receptor. They work on a class of receptors um, and they can cause any of the side effects that you see in the, in the uh, accompanying figure um, from central nervous system side effects to side effects involving the skin, the respiratory system, uh, the intestinal system, eyes, face, throat, heart, muscular system, um, gastric system, and other areas. So opiates have a variety of uh, side effects in addition to their primary effect on uh, pain signal transmission and pain relief. When we talk about physical dependence and tolerance, these are things, again, that are independent of addiction and that happen regardless of um, uh, you know, whether someone's using them uh, for um, a month or a year or more. Physical dependence just describes a phenomenon of if you take that medication for a long period of time, um, you, uh, upon uh, stopping that medication, you're going to experience withdrawal type symptoms. It doesn't mean that you're addicted. Um, it doesn't mean that you have a problem. It's just the body's natural way of saying, hey, I'm used to having this uh, uh, compound, this chemical bind my receptors, and I'm going to let you know when it's gone because uh, you know, I feel like it should be there. Um, tolerance is a separate uh, phenomenon that uh, describes basically how if you take opiates over a long period of time, um, over time, it will take more of the opiate to achieve the same effect. Uh, for instance, if you were to start on a low dose of hydrocodone for chronic pain, which has been done uh, countless times in this country over the last 30 years, um, over time, that low dose of hydrocodone you'll find is ineffective. It could take days, it could take weeks or months. Um, and many times this is how patients end up on very high doses of opiates uh, for treatment of their pain. Withdrawal, as you see, can be challenging and isn't limited, again, just to addicts. Um, anybody who's on opiates for a long period of time is going to experience withdrawal, whether they have um, addiction or not. And the timeline there, as you can see, uh, for short and long acting opiates is a little different, um, but generally you achieve a symptom, a symptom peak sometime after about two or three days. And then uh, thankfully the withdrawal symptoms get better. You cannot die from opiate withdrawal, but um, many times patients feel like they may or like they have a really bad flu or um, uh, you know, need to go to the emergency room or something for withdrawing from opiates. Um, and, and in particular there, you can see hydrocodone as an example, since hydrocodone is uh, pretty much the most commonly prescribed opiate in uh, the United States. It used to go under the name brand of Lortab. Of course, Lortab was taken off the market several years ago. It's been replaced by Norco um, and some other formulations of even long acting hydrocodone. Um, which, uh, you know, can contain various uh, concentrations of Tylenol uh, with it. So, um, you know, we would be uh, probably remiss if we didn't talk about the opioid epidemic in a talk like this. Um, this is something that we in uh, the healthcare field for many, many years have been inundated with a discussion of the opioid, opioid epidemic. And this has bled uh, definitely into popular culture. And I'm sure uh, unless you've been living under a rock for the last 10 years, you've heard a lot about the opioid epidemic um, from lawsuits and from um, you know, alleged wrongs. And um, you know, there are lots of people have opinions on uh, the epidemic and uh, what it all entails. But you know, essentially, just by means of history, you know, during the 1990s, uh, there was an increase in opioid prescribing. And there was this real focus, actually, uh, uh, altruistic and, and um, genuine focus on making sure that we treated pain well in the medical community. Um, pain for a long time had thought to have been uh, overlooked uh, in the care and evaluation of patients. And with many emerging uh, opioid type treatments, um, it was thought that some of these treatments uh, would be good for patients in the long term to help uh, decrease their pain. There were assurances, of course, from drug companies during this time that there was little risk for addiction. And that's where a lot of the um, uh, lawsuits come into play um, that maybe the drug companies knew better and weren't uh, telling physicians or telling patients and being honest with them. Um, in 2017, more than 47,000 Americans died from an opioid overdose. Um, that includes prescription opioids, heroin, and of course, illegally manufactured fentanyl, which has emerged on the market more recently. Um, almost a quarter of patients prescribed opioids for chronic pain misuse them. And that can be anything from overtaking the medication to giving it to someone else, to getting it from a, a different source, um, or uh, to uh, simply not taking it as prescribed. 
Um, between 8 and 12 percent of patients uh, who use an opioid for chronic pain develop an opioid use disorder. And about 5% of patients who misuse opioid, uh, prescription opioids transition to things like heroin in particular. Um, the opioid epidemic um, uh, you know, is often blamed for transition to, uh, you know, it's like a gateway drug transition to more powerful opioids, um, you know, prescription opioids into things like heroin. Um, but the facts do bear out that about 80% of people who misuse uh, opioids, prescription opioids, um, go on to, uh, you know, use heroin. Um, opioid misuse in the United States costs $78.5 billion a year. And of course, um, what really brought a lot of this to light was an increased focus by the CDC um, and their, you know, release of landmark guidelines in 2016, um, which outlined the responsible use of opioids and um, really drew a light and put a light on uh, this topic of opioid-related um, side effects and overdose-related deaths. Um, you can see the graphic there is um, one of the flyers that was placed in a lot of offices, including mine at the time, um, and it was guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain um, with a lot of statistics there that hopefully get people's attention and help us uh, focus on the fact that, you know, opioids are responsible for a problem in this country and that we all have a, a responsibility to try to help uh, this problem to get better over time. Um, thankfully, 17 states since uh, over the 2017-2018 timeframe um, uh, were recording, you know, opioid overdose death data. And since the release of these guidelines, um, did not see an increase uh, in opioid related overdose deaths. And so, you know, the thinking is that as opioid prescribing guidelines go into effect and um, physicians and patients are being more careful with the use of opioids, that um, over time overdose related deaths are going down. Um, and at least not seeing increases. So that really begs the question, what else can be done for pain? You know, are, are we basically just saying that, well, patients have to suffer and we're not gonna do anything else uh, for pain. We're not gonna provide opiates or, um, you know, prescriptions for medications to help. Definitely not. Um, so, you know, some of the treatments that are available, we'll break this up into um, conservative modalities and interventional options and even surgery. And uh, I have to warn you that some of the slides to come are a little busy. Um, but in the interest of time, we probably won't cover everything on each slide, but um, this is really just to give you an overview of uh, all the treatments that are available for pain and that there's a lot more that can be done than opiates. Um, so under conservative modalities, you know, the number one thing is time. Um, again, there's both acute and chronic pain. Acute pain is expected to resolve after a certain amount of time. And so if uh, there's a pain uh, that comes up and it's not a worrisome type pain, like we'll discuss later, um, time many times is all that's needed um, to help uh, resolve that problem. The body heals on its own, and uh, there are a lot of, you know, thankfully a lot of healing processes that go on in our bodies uh, without, you know, the help of doctors or other healthcare providers, and uh, time is all that's needed for the body to be able to accomplish those goals. Of course, activity modification can be very important. Um, making sure that you're uh, moving in the right ways. And for instance, if you've, you know, herniated a disc in your back, that you're not uh, continuing to pick up heavy things or bend or lift or twist in ways that are make, gonna make that herniation worse or um, that are gonna aggravate your body's you know, naturally, natural you know, healing uh, capability. Of course, home therapies, things like ice or heat or stretching, um, exercise, bracing, those things are important. And then of course we have uh, you know, physical modalities like physical therapy, um, occupational therapy, massage, chiropractic care, acupuncture, um, and even psychological counseling, things like cognitive behavioral therapy or and biofeedback and, and several others. Cognitive behavioral therapy um, being one of the most uh, well-verified uh, pain management uh, treatments in all of the medical literature. Of course, there are complementary and alternative medicines, um, things like uh, vitamins and minerals and uh, you know, uh, different things like turmeric and, and uh, supplements and things like that. And of course, we don't discount those. We don't have a lot of great data on those type uh, treatments, but more data is coming out all the time. And uh, those type of alternative medicines um, can be a very important conservative modality uh, for patients uh, uh, with complaints um, that uh, you know, are able to respond to this. So uh, conservative modalities are very important uh, and often overlooked uh, uh, pain treatment. When we talk about um, medications, well, there are lots of non-opioid medications uh, that are available. 
things like over-the-counter analgesics. Analgesics just mean relief of pain. And so um, in this category, you have things like Tylenol or acetaminophen. You have medications like aspirin. Um, you even have topical treatments like uh, menthol or capsaicin, lidocaine, uh, which is a numbing uh, agent, um, even blue emu and other things that we don't really know how they work, but they seem to provide some topical relief. Um, now you do have over-the-counter NSAIDs, which are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, um, ibuprofen, naproxen, and their, their name brands for both of those. Um, you do have to be careful with those type medications, even though they're over the counter and you may think that, well, you know, they come in a big pill bottle, so they must be safe. Um, you know, you really should pay close attention to um, the uh, package inserts and follow the package inserts and stay within a safe range on those type medications. Um, you really shouldn't be, you know, eating through, uh, you know, a handful of ibuprofen a couple of times a day, every day. Um, so it is a conservative treatment for a lot of patients. Um, but not something that you should be um, overusing or over relying on uh, because those things can be dangerous. You know, just like we talked about opiates having side effects, um, some of these treatments can have side effects too. So we have to balance those side effects with uh, the benefit. Um, uh, continuing uh, non opioid medication management, um, there are prescription uh, non opioid medications that we can rely on, things like NSAIDs in the prescription class. Now we have medications like diclofenac. Um, meloxicam, Celebrex, or Celecoxib. Um, these are medications that are potent anti-inflammatories that may be slightly more specific for um, uh, inflammation that could be responsible for pain and that sometimes are more safe than uh, over-the-counter opioids um, when we're talking about comparing potency. Um, but again, this is a class of medications that you have to be very careful with and make sure that you're not overusing or um, you know, taking too much of because they can have side effects as well side effects uh, primarily on the stomach lining. Um, so which is why you should always take those medications with food. And um, even on the kidneys, they can decrease kidney perfusion. Um, and if uh, your patient that has, uh, you know, kidney or liver failure, um, you may have to decrease or not take these type medications. Um, if you're on a blood thinner, for instance, you should not take NSAIDs either over the counter or be prescribed them because they can cause dangerous bleeding. Um, Antidepressant type medications like amitriptyline, nortriptyline, and several others there are an interesting class of pain medications. And uh, when we think of pain medication, we don't think of antidepressants. It's not because uh, antidepressants help with depression that they help with pain. They actually decrease the levels of certain neurotransmitters that are involved in pain signal transmission. And so you can see I've included uh, something there called the SNRI mechanism of action. That's for selective norepinephrine uh, or serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Um, and uh, you can see a little cartoon of kind of how they work basically to um, uh, inhibit uh, the reuptake of those molecules and increase uh, their uh, duration of action uh, outside of the cells. And so that can help decrease pain signal transmission. Um, what other non-opioid medication uh, uh, management options are there? Well, there are muscle relaxants, and you can see a number of them listed there. Um, if you've had a muscle strain or sprain, you may have been prescribed uh, any of these. Um, there are also anti-seizure medications. Chiefly, um, gabapentin is uh, kind of the prototype of this class, but there's also things like Lyrica. There are um, uh, anti-seizure medications like carbamazepine. There are topical prescription strength uh, medications like lidocaine and diclofenac, some of the medications that we've already mentioned. There are indeed compounding creams um, that, again, we don't have great uh, literature for or evidence as to why they work the way they do, but they seem to provide great relief for uh, various patients. Um, when we talk about procedures, there are a number of procedures, and this is kind of the area of my own expertise as an interventional pain uh, physician. Most of what I do in treating pain involves injections, and there are a number of injections that can help with chronic pain conditions. You'll see uh, things as simple as trigger point injections, all the way to sophisticated nerve blocks and nerve root blocks, um, looking at peripheral nerves, and even doing other more fancy procedures like ablations of those nerves, um, or performance of things like kyphoplasty or implantation of uh, various spine devices, even uh, devices to block pain signals, and um, even pain pumps that can be implanted um, that don't necessarily have to have opioids in them. So we'll talk some about uh, these and we'll try not to get lost in the weeds too much. But uh, for instance, uh, one of the most common injections that I perform is an epidural steroid injection for treatment of back pain or neck pain. 
um, or specifically, uh, you know, uh, pains that involve disc problems or pinched nerves. There are different approaches to these type injections. Um, and some of this may be outside the scope of this uh, discussion, but as you can see, you know, by inserting a needle through some of the structures there, the skin, the muscle, through the ligament, and then finally into, um, in this case, the epidural space, um, we can administer steroid and numbing agents in that area to help block pain signals and decrease pain signal transmission. There are lots of different ways uh, to do these injections, and there are lots of different reasons why these injections could be a good idea in certain patients that are dealing with pain. Now, this is not something that um, a non-pain specialist uh, would usually be performing. This is something that, um, you know, if you needed this type of treatment, you'd need to be seeing someone who does basically what I do. Um, but this is an advanced form of pain management and something that can be very effective for patients who live with chronic pain. Um, facet joint injections or um, uh, joint injections in general can be very useful uh, for treatment of pain. And there are both therapeutic and diagnostic varieties of these injections. Therapeutic injections being the purpose, you know, is to get your relief. A diagnostic um, joint injection or even joint block is um, uh, just for that, to diagnose whether or not uh, that joint is indeed responsible for the pain that someone is experiencing. So here you can see some examples um, of a needle, for instance, going into what looks like a very hot uh, lumbar facet joint. Um, and then there's also some x-ray uh, images since we do use x-rays mostly for these type injections. You can see a needle being advanced to the hip there um, under a fluoroscopy machine and some medication being injected there. And then in the far uh, bottom right picture, you see a needle uh, placed in a knee and uh, some contrast and probably medication being injected into that uh, knee joint. There are nerve blocks and there, uh, basically if there's a nerve that's carrying pain signals in the uh, body, uh, that nerve can be blocked by a specialist like myself. Um, we can do both diagnostic, therapeutic blocks, and we can even do blocks in anticipation of ablation like we talked about before. And ablation um, is usually accomplished through use of a machine that delivers a radio frequency current into uh, a specialized needle that um, is translated into heat at the tip of that needle. And that heat, um, typically it's 80 degrees, which is uh, in the realm of 170 something degrees Fahrenheit, um, is hot enough to destroy the nerve. Um, and uh, you know, like a good nervous system, the body is gonna try to repair itself Unfortunately, uh, many times it means that nerve grows back over time um, and those treatments need to be repeated, but um, that can be, you know, six months, nine months, 12 months of pain relief for a lot of patients, which is a long time, especially when you're used to dealing with pain on a daily basis. Um, in addition to those type things, we can do selective nerve blocks and peripheral nerve blocks. Again, if there's a, if there's a nerve in the body that's carrying pain signals, we can probably block it and get uh, someone pain relief. Um, in terms of more fancy procedures for alleviation of pain, um, let's say you've got a spine fracture. Um, and this is a particular area of interest for me. And this is something that I do on a regular basis. Um, patients are sent to me for um, fixation of spine fractures, um, in particular uh, vertebral compression fractures. So in these pictures here, you can see uh, this patient has a compression fracture of one of their vertebrae. Um, I'll use the mouse on the screen here to show you that um, this vertebrae here is collapsed. It doesn't look like this vertebrae above or this vertebrae below. This one, the roof is caved in. And so what a specialist like myself might do is in, uh, insert an instrument in through uh, part of the bone here and put a balloon into uh, the bone, um, expand that balloon to create a cavity and then fill that cavity with cement. And as the cement hardens, it uh, releases a lot of heat and the heat helps to cauterize some of the nerves in that area and stabilizes the fracture. And so um, this is one of probably my most favorite procedures to do. I probably shouldn't have favorite procedures, but I really like this one because um, many times it does result in pain relief for patients who have spine fractures. Um, there are also implanted therapies, things like spinal cord stimulation, intrathecal drug pumps, and even interspinous devices. And um, you know, again, without getting into the weeds too much, because some of this may be on, uh, be beyond kind of the scope of uh, this type talk, but uh, these are devices that are used to actually block pain signals. Um, and there are really fancy ways that these devices work um, for sometimes our most complicated patients to help uh, decrease their pain levels and to give them a relief on a regular basis. Um, for instance, spinal cord stimulation has been around since the 1970s. Um, it's most commonly used for low back problems or, or for uh, leg problems or arm problems. 
um, from things like complex regional pain syndrome or from uh, conditions like cervical or lumbar radiculopathy that come from stenosis. And you probably you may have heard that word stenosis before, just tightening around the nerves. Um, so spinal cord stimulation is a very effective therapy that helps to block pain signals really at a, um, a, a cellular level and to decrease pain signal transmission and the perception of pain. Um, so it can be a very useful therapy for patients who have failed other more conservative modalities. Of course, this does involve implantation of a device um, and we don't take that lightly, but it can be a very useful um, treatment for patients who've been dealing with chronic pain conditions, especially involving the neck or the low back. Um, and there are uh, even more fancy versions of this nowadays called dorsal root ganglion stimulation, where if you have pain in a very particular, very precise area, if you can put a hand on it, uh, you know, in, a, in your lower extremity, say, you know, part of your knee or your uh, ankle or your foot, um, the dorsal root ganglion stimulation is a very um, targeted way to approach that pain. Now, uh, intrathecal drug pumps are uh, pumps that are about the size of a hockey puck. They're implanted in the abdomen or in the back. Um, and they deliver medication straight into the uh, spinal fluid. Many times that medication is opiate type medication, but the benefit of that is that um, the doses that are used are much lower, the incidence of side effects tends to be lower, and it's something that patients don't have to worry about managing on their own. It's managed by the physician, and the pump is just like uh, the old Crock-Pot commercials, set it and forget it. Um, you basically let it run in the background and alleviate pain. And of course, uh, there at the bottom there, you see um, things like intraspinous spacers and fixation devices and lots of other things that are shy of uh, the next slide, which is actual surgery. Um, and surgery can be both minimally invasive, um, you know, forms of surgery like my, what might be done by myself or uh, even, you know, nurse surgeons or orthopedic surgeons, all the way up to typical traditional um, fusion type surgeries, joint replacements, arthroscopies and other type things that may be done. Um, if a painful condition exists and there's a surgical fix to that condition. So uh, finally, you know, what should I do if I have pain? Well, certainly if you experience worrisome symptoms, new symptoms, new numbness, shooting pain, weakness, muscle shrinkage, pain that doesn't go away with normal conservative treatments, or if it's just a new onset severe pain, um, if it's bad enough that you think that you need to go to see someone, trust your gut call your primary care provider, call your primary care physician, or see a pain specialist. Um, there's this idea that pain leads to anxiety um, and the brain becomes focused on the problem, changes in the nervous system take place that potentiate the pain, which causes uh, patients to stop moving and have more anxiety, which leads to more problems and more pain. And so there's this chronic pain cycle that you see illustrated here that can be a real problem. So I encourage you know, anyone listening to this that may have pain complaints, or struggle with chronic pain symptoms, um, get help if you feel like you need help. Um, you can see folks like myself, your primary care physician, um, or, or um, you know, anyone associated with this program uh, to help get some advice on uh, how to get your pain treated. So in conclusion, uh, pain is a part of the human condition. We all have to live with pain at some time in our lives, and there are lots of treatments, including conservative modalities, non-opioid medications, and procedures. Um, opioids certainly are indicated sometimes in some scenarios, um, for instance, after surgery or after a trauma, um, but for chronic pain conditions, especially, there are often other treatments that carry less risk and may be more effective. Um, so I encourage you um, to explore some of these options with your primary care provider or a pain specialist like myself, and um, certainly would be happy to, um, you know, if you need to contact me or anyone else involved with this program to get some help. These are some references if you're interested, and um, I very much appreciate uh, your attention for uh, this talk. And certainly if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach back out to us. Um, and uh, thank you, have a great day.